Welcome to another episode of Look It's Rock and Roll, a podcast about music or whatever we want to talk about. Um, today's topic is we're going to dig into an album. Ken, why don't you intro that album and uh, tell us why you chose to put us through this arduous process of vetting and uh, yeah. analysis. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't too difficult of a process for you. Uh doing it and listening to the music but um i chose an album i chose the album uh time by elo which is the electric light orchestra um, the album yes was released in 1981 uh summer 81 um the one of the reasons i chose it is it's kind of an album that if you're an elo fan um it's an album that either some some ELO fans, traditionalists, didn't like it, and then other ones think it's maybe their best album. Um, and what it was is because it was kind of a left turn for them because they started using, you know, it was, it was full on synthesizers going on in, mm -hmm. in this album, um, which is a, a, a drastic turn from you know, guitars, keyboards, some synthesizers, and a lot of uh, orchestra going on, hence the name, right? Um, so I thought, well, you know, I want, but I go back to when I got this album um, that it was such a, you know, different turn, like left turn, but the thing is I, I enjoyed the heck out of it just because of the, you know, the quality of the music and the you know the catchiness of it and and so on so i like it. it's one of my favorite you know elo albums and i thought well this is kind of a underrated or to a degree a lot of people don't know about it um and i compare it to things like the other left turns that happened at the same same year like you know kiss you know the elder that was a bit major left turn mm. <laughs> a bigger turn uh than what this album was so uh i thought well you know i really enjoy this album i never get sick of it so i thought well, i'm gonna let the guys that you guys you know check it out hopefully you've probably never heard most or all of the album or, or maybe one song so you were here. you were an elo fan before this album came i became out, a and, fan and it was a new yep. experience for you yeah, yeah i was gonna ask that actually. yeah the, th the thing is it was uh i was a fan starting 77. the same oh, guy that okay. got me hooked into kiss the same year actually got me hooked onto elo which is interesting and my first yellow purchase was out of the blue which is one of their you know top albums double albums so mm -hmm. um so i was kind of hooked from then on and uh started checking you know their back catalog and and going forward so i didn't know what to expect I was pleasantly surprised on this album because it was a drastic change from the prior couple albums, maybe, you know, uh, discovery and then half of the Xanadu uh, movie soundtrack. So, right. Lonnie, what about you? Were you an ELO fan before you were given this task of exploring time? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I downloaded a couple of, ELO albums to kind of, well, I downloaded this and I downloaded um, just like a very best of just to kind of get kind of, you know, get, get used to, um, you know, what I'm dealing with here. And actually I downloaded the, the, before I really did my research on the show, what we were really talking about, I just downloaded like a very best of just kind of getting acclimated with, with ELO. And I downloaded on iTunes, a very best of ELO. And the first thing that came on was Mr. Blue Sky. Oh. And, and I'm like, this sounds like something that would be like a montage in a Muppet movie. And what is what is Ken making me listen to here? I was I was very confused, and I was like, "What is this?" And then "Evil Woman" was the second track. I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, I know this song. So, okay, I'll, I'll I'll open the door back up. I won't be so close minded." <laughs> so, All right. But Mr. Scott was the first thing I ever listened. But ever listened. Like, Evil Woman's like, oh. You know, I guess I and 
it made me feel like okay well they're a band that like of other like a, like a lot of other bands out there like oh i didn't know that's who sang this song type of thing mm-hmm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. so i'm like oh okay well i'm okay now now i know kind of what what i'm dealing with and kind of got my feet wet and, and moved on from there but on my way to work i had mr blue sky on and i'm like what in the world Did am i listening to? <laughs> yeah i felt like i felt like the sun should have been dancing as i was driving the way you know <laughs> So, anyway, <laughs> All right. let's go north of the border and the Canadian point of view. Mark, what about you? Well, um, ELO was never a band that I was really into myself. My drummer in my band was big into ELO because his brother was big into it. But I was aware of ELO because once again, good old older sister Jane in the bedroom, you would hear every once in a while. Before we get up and go, don't bring me down. All the time was coming out of there. She would listen. She had Discovery and all those records. I was like, oh, boy, here we go. And I don't dislike it, but it's definitely not, you know, on the top of my list. But I, I did have a, you know, d- decent time listening to this record. Uh, I, you know, there was a, quite a bit of it that I thought was interesting and definitely of its time. But I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah, so for myself, I did something similar to Lonnie. I just went back to the two albums before this, which I thought would set the tone musically. Mm. What have I heard of ELO in the past? Well, what was on the radio? So 10, 5, 38, or uh, Overture, mm. or whatever it is, Evil Woman, and probably whatever Mark was singing. See, I don't even know the song. Don't let me down. <laughs> There's also another one, Do Ya? which um, oh, yeah. obviously yeah. was Ace Frehley on Trouble Walking. And while that was a cover of the Move song, which ELO then did again in 1976, which I know those details because of writing about the songs, that that was it. I was not a fan. I've never owned an ELO album until now. Um, and I only own this after listening to it on Spotify like 20 times. I'm like, wow, I better, I better actually pay the artist for this one. Oh, it's only $3 on Amazon, brand new. So, you know. Wow, that's a so, deal. So there you go. So, no, I wasn't aware of them. Am I aware of Jeff Lynn individually? Oh, you oh, yeah. better freaking believe it because one of my mm. all-time favorite albums is The Traveling Wilburys. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, um, very aware of Jeff Lynn. So, you know, I, I found it to be a really fun exploration. The two albums that preceding it, I, I found a little bit disco-y in parts, but they were ver- they're very dated uh, to that era mm-hmm. that they were created, but mm-hmm. they had some fantastic songs on them, but ones I couldn't tell you the titles of, which I enjoyed off the top of my head. I'm just not familiar <laughs> enough with the catalog at this point. Um, but it was, it was a really fun kind of exercise and that's the whole object of these exercises is to introduce ourselves and our listeners to music that they may or may not be aware of and uh to look at our for them to enjoy maybe our discomfort at trying to discuss it so um um i I think we've kind of covered you know the first two main questions um out of it and and probably even the the third had you ever heard time before no so let's jump into kind of the fourth question here and that is you know how does this music compare to other music that was released at the time in 1981 Mm. as ken mentioned you had albums like kisses music from the elder coming out that took a total left turn you had sticks and paradise uh theater coming out which was kind of grand project as well wasn't it because Mm -hmm. that became a a massive stage show and they even did the return to paradise theater as a follow-on years later and that had some of their biggest hits before they kind of lost the plot um rush moving pictures um Mm -hmm. yeah what else can you say about moving pictures you only have to say the (laughs) the title and then i think you had genesis abcab uh which i'm not Mm -hmm. familiar with i have one genesis album what i have a single genesis you have one more you have one more than i do julie (laughs) yeah i've got i've got invisible touch shame on you guys hey i've got one shame on lottie he doesn't have any (laughs) And it doesn't sound like he's going to to either. So, um, Mark, why don't we start with you on that, since you're very vocal today. You know, how does it compare to kind of the other stuff that was released in 81? Honestly, and Ken, you know, you're my brother. You know, um, (laughs) we we do things together, and, I, you know, we do lots of podcasts, and I respect your opinion. You are the voice of reason. But compared to the records I was listening to from this time period, it doesn't compare to me, to me at least. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, you got to understand, I was listening to like Allied Forces by Triumph, oh, you know, yeah. moving, moving pictures, 
by Rush, you know, and I was I was listening to, um, like the Kiss that I was listening to was mainly through my sister still at that time, and she was listening to still like older records like Love Gun and stuff like that at that period. Uh, I don't think we ever had the Elder in our house at that time, to be honest with you. Um, but and uh, and Styx was was huge, you know, especially in my house around that time. My sister was right into sticks i mean to the point of where she got in contact with them about helping them do a music video this is a long story for another time but um there's a, a like but that's the kind of influence that was in my like my house at that time and that's what i was listening to really at that time i was you know how i am with rush i'm head over heels for them still and uh while i can appreciate this record a, a hell of a lot more now and especially appreciate him Jeff Lynn as a music producer who's done some stellar stuff like we just mentioned Traveling Wilburys is one of the greatest things that he's put his hands on to right so I, I think it's a you know I think that he needs to be looked at as a fantastic musician overall right absolutely I, I yeah. guess this would be interesting going to Lonnie for for <laughs> you know how does it relate to kind of the other albums of 1981 for you well you know I, I so obviously I was two years old in 1981, so I can't, I don't really have much of a, of a comparison um, other than like maybe rubber ducky at 19, in 1981, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's what was big for me in 1981. But <laughs> if you look at Al, but, but you can still, you know, look back and say, okay, what, what came out in 1991? Okay. Well, point of entry came out in 1981 for those about to rock the elder. So, you know, too for fast those about, for love. Too fast. That's perfect. Too fast for love came out in 1981. Mm -hmm. So you look at what rock music was just in a snapshot of that year. You have some some landmark albums, and you have a left turn from Kiss, and what Ken has already described as a a left turn from ELO. You know it, and it's very 80s sounding. It very it it. You know, it, it sounds very, very 80s and what you can see the influence of what came after a, a 80s pop music. So, you know, I, th I think that point is interesting as well as you get a left turn from from two, you know, substantial bands in 1981. While other bands are like ACDC and Motley Crue and, and Judas Priest are, you know, doing their thing at the time. So it, it's, you know, and, and I think you could do that for a lot of years, but just being a, a talking about ELO and Julian having a, a kiss banner behind him. It's interesting for this group even more so. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, I mean, number one is 1981. What was I listening to? I was listening to John Lennon, nearly just shave fish yeah. um, and you know, rock and roll music, rubber soul, Sergeant peppers. Um, who else would there have been for me at, at that time? maybe Duran Duran had entered the picture. But my my relationship with an album, say Music from the Elder, goes back 35 years, not 40, you know, to really have this ingrained in my DNA musically. So all of those releases in 1981, you know, the moving pictures, I mean, Christ, that's Rush. I mean, that mm -hmm. is so ingrained on me that this really mm -hmm. can't compare just because I haven't had that relationship with the album for 30 20 10 years even in in order to really judge it and i don't want to compare it to kiss's music from the elder because they're coming from completely different uh, kind of directions artistically and with completely different players now mm -hmm. with kiss you can be surprised that they were able to attain a certain step up in musicality but when you listen back to the back catalog of elo you're not surprised at all by the construction or the detail with which this album is constructed. Paradise Theater, maybe, but again, I was never into Sticks. Uh, they were, they were the we used to beat up the kids who listened to Sticks. So you know, they were that was that was crap. And I was in, like I said, I wasn't into Genesis. So um, you know, how how does it compare? Because it wasn't part of my buffet. Um, mm -hmm. I I can't compare it to that other stuff. I can only say that. Um, you know, I'm not going out licking lampposts trying to get the coronavirus as a result of listening to this album. I actually, you know, <laughs> judge it to be a, you know, a decent experience. Ken, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I was listening to other stuff. I was listening to Moving Pictures at the time. I was a big Rush fan too. Uh, I listened to all kinds of music. I was, you know, back then around I was Van Halen. You know, um, Foreigner Four was big. I think around that same time. Um, so, and they actually started using synthesizers, which is funny on on Foreigner Four more so. Um, but uh, that yeah, this album is just another album that i listened to at the time uh and it's just good music uh, you know the other albums i like could be hard rock could be you know prog prog rock whatever pop if it's good it's good um this album's just kind of it is like lonnie said kind of a it has an 80 sound you know uh but it was ahead of its time i think it it led actually and no pun intended right ahead of its time i didn't mean to do that but wow. uh, it it was <laughs> ahead of its time <laughs> and uh there's other you know uh electro synth pop came you know after that um flock of seagulls whatever whoever you know came after that um so i think it was you know and the thing about it is he didn't continue on that you know, a quest uh, of making another one just like this. Um, so it was kind of interesting. It's kind of stuck out by, you know, like, like a sore thumb, I guess, in a way, in the ELO albums uh, by itself. So, so you're naturally, I, I guess, the best person to ask this question to first. You know, what were your impressions of the, you know, the sonics and production of the album when you you first heard it, um, especially having that history of having heard their albums previous to it? Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> first of all yeah the synthesizers you know the strings are gone the strings are now synthesized strings um it's all pretty much you know in your face and what they say is they compared jeff lynn to in a way is like phil specter uh it's like a, a wall of sound kind of thing and that's what jeff lynn he does produce like that just you know kind of a wall of sound kind of pro, you know production um it's just that it was just while it's that wall of sound it's very clear uh i can hear everything um but everything works even you know the the way they do the vocals differently you know record it like it's almost like it's being sung through a, a 1930s microphone or, or something like that you know it's just certain things are the way he put the album together, the way he inserted snippets of music or things in between the songs to kind of tie the songs together to just keep keep the flow going, um, it was very interesting. Um, I just think it's a, it was it was just I was really surprised when I heard it, but I was actually happily surprised. Like, wow, I really you know this is really I like this you know. What, what he's doing here so did you like the cars in 1981 by chance i did like the cars okay. that makes sense that makes sense yeah no, and just... yeah yeah so yeah i i started with the cars with the first album so and, and their progression and so i yeah i can see where you're going there um i did like that kind of sound what about know? abba i liked abba too hmm. and abba has you know very melodic catchy songs i got on you know to abba i think I, the first thing i got with Abba was like a 1976 five i got their greatest you know first greatest hits album and i loved you know sos and the other songs and the sos mm -hmm. i thought was just fantastic i just loved that song so see, yeah see that carries on from the point i'm trying to make is first impressions when listening to the album for me was like wow this is like you take abba the cars John Lennon and the Beatles, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And Jean Michel Jarre, and throw them in a blender. And out comes every time I'm listening to a song, I'm like, holy shit, that could be John Lennon. Or holy exactly. crap, he's imitating Roy Orbison. Or oh God, he's singing like Elvis. Mm -hmm. That the number of influences that are coming across all of this music that's being presented made me think about time more that he was bringing people in from different eras into his music um so there's your 50s rockabilly there's your kind of uh 
uh, what was that? The mods, you know, and kind of the early sixties, Dwayne Eddy, mm -hmm. the big, mm. I, and I thought it was a Gretsch guitar that he was playing on one of the songs getting really twangy echo. No, yeah. it, was, it was synth pure synth. Cause I, I had to look it up to see if I had any idea, but that was my first impression that this, the sound and production I find very static. There's not a lot of ebbs and flows in terms of the dynamics of the album for me. It's just very, it's not flat or monotone because that sounds negative. It's just very steady all the way across the songs as it tells or as it travels t mm -hmm. through time. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't really have any comments on it. The separation to me is fine of the instrumentation. Nothing's bullying anything else in terms of the song. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk to a real producer. Uh, Mark, your thoughts on you know sound and production when listening to it? Um, you know, it's interesting that you brought up all those other bands to can about, you know, the ABBA and the Cars and all that stuff. And those are all things that are, again, roaring through the Copernicki house at the time, uh, especially the ABBA. My parents were huge into it. We, have the, we still have all the original albums here somewhere. Uh, unbelievable. And I mean, the funny thing about ABBA, just really quickly, is that nowadays... There's so many videos on YouTube talking about the production of their albums. People are really starting to connect with the production work of that years after the fact. They were like a band that was light years ahead of their mm -hmm. time as far as production goes. And I think Jeff Lynn's kind of like that as well, I think. I think that while this record now sounds very dated, but at that time, I think a lot of the times people were thinking, going, wow, what the hell is this? Like, you know, it wasn't too mm -hmm. common to have, you know, uh, you know, like those kind of keyboards, like the sequencing keyboards or that you can sample stuff like fair lights and those kind of keyboards to come in there and reproduce, you know, orchestra sounds like the way that he was doing. And it, it was a big, big step. I mean, the funny thing is I was talking about the same thing when it came to Peter Gabriel, when he started doing his stuff in the 80s. That was a huge thing for him as well. And I, I can hear all those things that you were talking about as well, because I, there was a great... A, a description of what the influences and the sounds are on this record. It's not like 50s music, new wave, reggae, rockabilly, the Beatles, Phil Spector in the shadows, like all those things you can hear mm -hmm. on this on this record. And I mean, one of the things that made me smile right off the bat was the introduction, the very first song on the record, um, the, the prologue there. You have that sort of, you know, computerized voice, almost like an early nod to Mr. Roboto, which came much later after, but, you know, it's it's almost like they wanted to really like hit home the fact that this is a futuristic record, you know what I mean? Like time traveling thing, and what better way to do it than vocoder voices and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? So I think overall the production is really good. I I have a feeling Jeff Lynn, in retrospect, would have thought that if he knew that this album would have been as looked at years and years later, maybe he would have approached the production differently because I have a feeling that he pretty much wanted to make a record that was of that time period. Because when you listen to the other bands that were out at that time, it's not that different from the production work of some of the other bands. Lonnie, what about you and your first impressions of this of the album sonically? You know, sonically, as I mentioned earlier, it sounds very, very 80s with the synthesizers and... Mm -hmm the robotic voice to start off in the prologue, as Mark mentioned, it just, the, the robotic voice in the prologue just kind of sucked me in like, okay, okay, this is, this is where I'm at. This is, you know, time spent time stamp of, of where we're at, you know, but trying to sound futuristic in the eighties and what someone in 1981 thought was, fu was what future futuristic was going to be. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's, it's produced very, it's, it's produced, I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, a stereotype of 80s production, really, to me, like of pop, of pop 80s, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's different. It's not something I would have put on on my own, but that's why we're doing this, you know what I mean? That's exactly why we're doing this, is to, you know not only open up each other's eyes, but open up the listeners eyes and ears as well. So it, it's, it's not, but the production of it is very eighties and it, for someone who, for someone like, for someone who lived in, who was more than 
a toddler in the, at the time, you know, I would think that it would really open, it would like put you in a time capsule back to that. Just even if you put this on for the first time, if you're, if you're someone like me who never listened to this album before and you put this on, I think it would bring you back. The production would bring you back like, Oh yeah, this is, this is my wheelhouse right here. This kind of music, even though, even if you never listened to it before, it's very time. It's very, um, I don't even know what the right word is, but it's, it's, it's just, it's just time stamped for 1981. And it's, if that's what you're looking for, it's perfect. You know, and, and, I'm, and, and that's what they were going and that's what they were going for. That's it. I, I, from, from my listens to it, I think it achieved exactly the production that they were aiming for in 1981 for what they wanted to achieve. Yeah, and uh, again, it certainly works. You know, I haven't mentioned one band uh, which runs through some of this material as well, and it'd be wrong to not say Queen, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, uh, again, though not with quite the quality of production for me or my tastes that I find on Queen's albums. Um, so what are some of the songs and music that stood out for you when you're listening to this? I mean, that, that's a really tricky one, again, as you know, I kind of mentioned from my, the way I work, um, I don't have a long history with this album, so, you know, it, it was kind of tough to, you know, start thinking about these song titles. Lonnie, let's start just straight back with you on some of the songs that really you liked. Well, I like catchy, as, as you guys know from being on the show, I like really catchy songs. Um, you know, like I always say, like, my fav- like one of my favorite Kiss songs is Come On and Love Me. Why? Because it's so catchy. So I love a good catchy song. So for me, what really stood out to me is Hold On Tight. Cause it's very catchy and it sucked me in immediately. I really, it's very up. It's very catchy. It's the kind of song that, that I really like. So that to me was, was the biggest, to me was the biggest standout on the album. Cause it is it's like, all right, well, this is, this is, this is right into my wheelhouse right here. Um, some of the others, not so much, but that one, that one to me is the standout. Ken smiling like, of course you like that song. I hate that song. It's so not what yellow is all about. <laughs> that was a great song. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ken. Well, since you, what do you since, think, Ken? Come on. Yeah, yeah, Ken. What? <laughs> this is your this is your topic. And and, <laughs> yeah. and and let's clarify for you. You don't get to answer the same question because I, I guess I want to know for you what were the ones that jumped out for you in 1981, and what are the ones that you kind of go to today? Yeah. Well, what what kind of jumped out at me at the beginning were songs like. Uh, uh, the twilight, first of all, just the, the way it it comes right out of the gate and and its harmonies and the catchiness of it and the the background vocals um, and the pulsating rhythm of that song, it's just it's just very cool. Um, and then I thought, okay, that was a great song. And then so I got to the next song, and then you know, yours truly, twenty ninety five was kind of cool, <clears throat> where it led in with these like weird noises right before it which turned out to be uh recorded pinball machine um noises that uh, jeff lynn had recorded and put in the stuck in there um but, but another good song with a different kind of you know vocal treatment um one one that always stands out to me was ticket to the moon which is the more the least synth kind of song on the album it's a you know mellow song and 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 it gives the atmosphere of you know one of the choruses in there where it's if i can feel that you know him floating i can feel it in the music floating through space the way it's being sung and the sound the whole sound it's and sort you know that sort of thing um and then here is the news another one you know a frank that type song i thought was so cool i was like holy cow this is you know the coolest thing I, i've never heard this before you know it's just so cool um and then yeah like i think i even heard hold on tight even before it was on the radio as a single um which you know lonnie mentioned and and obvious was an obvious you know song that was going to be a hit and and be a single itself so 
And, you know, I, I love almost, I would say, every song on this album. I really do. <laughs> I love, and I, I don't get sick of it. I really don't get sick of this album. That's reassuring to know that you had us discuss an album that you don't get sick of any song on the album, because otherwise I'd be questioning your wisdom. Um, Mark, wh what about you for the standouts? Um, well, I have to admit that uh, that whole prologue and uh, you know Twilight combination is very strong. I thought it was a good introduction to the album. I've, you know, I've always been one of those guys that love records that have really strong introductions like that. And uh, while the re rest of the record had its moments, like uh, I, f I thought the best songs really were the first one and the last one. I thought Hold On Tight was also a, a great song at the very, very end. In the middle, there was a lot of different uh, variations of style and stuff like that. But one song in there that I thought that was extremely interesting was the, the way life's meant to be. Um, I thought that that song was very interesting because it definitely showed a lot of Beatle influence. The singing was so Roy Orbison when I heard that. I'm like, wow, this is something that, you know, I was almost wondering because I don't know enough about the Traveling Wilbury. That this might sound like a stupid question, but it almost sounds like they could have took the song and covered it on that record. I, I guarantee if they would have took the song and got totally. them to do it. To I mean, there's several songs on it. this album that could have been yeah. on the Wilburys. It, it's just totally in that wheelhouse, some of the material, uh, from, yeah. my, from my point of reference anyway. Yeah, that's why when I first heard that, I was like, wow, this is something that totally would have worked with that group. And even back then, he was writing these kind of songs and had that kind of vision of it. And it's, it's almost like he was thinking, you know, you know, in the future, if I work with Roy Orbison, this would be a perfect song for him to do. You know, because it and it's amazing how he has that ability to make you think of these things. Like when you listen to some of the songs, you can totally hear that 50s influence and you can hear like the Phil Spector in his production and you can hear you know the little bits of reggae here and there influence like it's it's incredible how he can just insert these things in there and you kind of put a little smile on your face saying wow there it is now now i see what they're talking about so the, as far as um standout songs it would probably change if i listened to this record like every day for like two three months straight and maybe it would have grown on me differently but right away those three songs are the ones that instantly jumped out at me that's that's a good selection to go with. I mean, and you know, I had hold on tight in my list as well. And like you, Mark Twilight for the exact same reasons. Um, but going into some of these things, like you were saying, these these kind of elements that jump out at you. I mean, his love of the Beatles is apparent because you've got songs that sound like John, and Rain is Falling is my number one off this album. I'm like that could have been a John Lennon song, um, but there are also songs that sound like George. Uh, which again mm -hmm. takes you back to the Wilburys mm -hmm. with uh, some of the vocals, and there's some that sound like Tom Petty. So it, it's it's like again, it's probably me projecting against what came later, going back. So I'm fully enveloped in time here. Um, but a really good song that stood out to me was "Another Heartbreaks," mm -hmm. uh, which musically is just absolutely epic with the Oberheim synth. And mm. that's where, you know, I'm talking about the Gretsch that I see, you know, just being all like twangy, running it through a, you know, an FX to really get that deep delay and twang going, which is all done synth, which mm -hmm. is it, just absolutely stunning. So musically, that one grabs me every time, even if the rest of it doesn't seem to make a whole, whole lot of sense. Okay, let's flip the coin. You know, what's some of the stuff that you don't like, Ken? <laughs> like I said... Like I said, I, there's, there's nothing I don't like. Um, but, uh, yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the Another Heart Breaks, it, which I think is cool. But for me, that's, just, that's the only song for me that kind of, well, there's two songs, that kind of breaks it up, uh, the flow a little bit, uh, you know, of the album. Uh, otherwise, you know, I guess at the end, you know, Hold on tight is kind of almost an afterthought in a way, uh, the the way it was stuck on at the end there. Um, but so I, I can't really say anything. And then you know the third thing you mentioned earlier, you, you mentioned Freddie Mercury. Uh, Mac engineered this album, who you know produced Queen albums at, at around that same time. Um, so 
So that's another interesting. And another thing I did mention about, you know, when you talk about rain is falling, uh, the way Jeff Lynn made the music sound like you could hear the, the music was the rain. You could hear the way the music was going was the raindrops falling. I mean, it's just, you know, no one's really done that since, but you know, like Buddy Holly, if you go back to, you know, Buddy Holly song, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but, uh, it's, same type of thing the music is simulates rain rain falling down and, and and hitting the ground that sort of thing so it was just so cool but yeah i, I mean again this album is one of the albums that i really and i listened to it a number of times the last you know a couple of weeks and yeah i i just don't get sick of it you clearly hate it lonnie i clearly hate it oh to me i'm i'm actually i to me, the two songs I really didn't care for was Rain is Falling <laughs> and When the Lights Go Down. I felt like oh, yeah. the lights go down like I was ready to fall asleep listening to it. <laughs> um, so, no, those two songs did not do it for me. Sorry, Julian, about Rain is Falling. But those two, I just really, they were kind of downers and just kind of felt like, all right, let's 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 get to the next one here. It was just. <laughs> it, it was it was not doing much for me at all, and I, I maybe maybe it's because I was running when I was listening to this the first time too, and I'm like, man, this is not helping. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. that, that, <laughs> that, that does not strike me as being a running album. No, it was not mm -hmm. good. No. I only ran to it one time. I was like, yeah, we're not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to it. And I tried to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that breaks my heart, Milani, because Rain is Sorry. Falling. I, I thought could have been the song on Beatles Anthology 3, you know, of which mm. he was involved in Real Love and Free as a Bird as well. So, True. again, it, it brings so many, you know, it's music. Mark, you know, what don't you like about time? Um, well, a lot of it I thought was, was pretty good. Like I said, the more I listened to it, the, the more it started growing on me. But the two songs that kind of... I had more trouble connecting with, believe it or not, is Ticket to the Moon. I kind of found was a little, mm. a little, little weepy here and there, right? <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, but, I, but I understand. I mean, in the context of the oh, story, it, mm. it probably made sense where it was and how it was presented and stuff like that. I mean, that's the thing you got to remember with a record like this. There are some concept records that are still you're able to just take your needle or put your skip button and go to it and just listen to them individually. And they're pretty strong songs. but other albums, you need to listen to the songs in the context that it's written for it to make full sense and for it to make full impact. And I have a feeling this is a record like that, where you'll probably need to, you're better off listening to it top to bottom than just saying, okay, I'm just going to drop the needle in the middle of this record and mm -hmm. see what happens. You know what I mean? Uh, and the other one that kind of, rubbed me a little wrong way maybe i was in a bad mood at the time or maybe i was just tired of the 80s thing at that moment but uh another hard breaks reminded me a little too much of miami vice there was a little too much do 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 like the simmons drums and the synth bass going on in there oh, i was just expecting miami to see that i was expecting to see the convertible car chasing after some drug dealers you know at that point when i heard that so but uh, it's you know it, it's not on it's not too different from, let's say, the, some of the drum production on the Genesis Avocab album or, or albums like that, where they had a lot of gated drums and they were bringing in the electronic drums, Phil was at that time too, right? So it's not foreign, but those are also the things I didn't like about some of the Genesis records too. I didn't like it when they started going into the overly gated drums. I was kind of like, eh, you know, but still the bad stuff off of here is still a lot better than some other bands. Good stuff. I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah. I, th to be honest, there wasn't anything I didn't like on it. You know, I'm not a big fan of a coder, but you know, <laughs> it, it sets the tone of being a futuristic concept <laughs> album. So it, it, the context makes sense. You know, it, it felt like a 1930s, you know, uh, Martian flick, you know, voice, <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of starting out for me so that that's a negative and then the only other thing that really jumped out that epilogue i i just thought was really kind of silly as a title and that it should have been called the end of time but if i'm going to say if there's anything yeah. that mm -hmm. well, it, nice little play on words you know they're just being yeah. creative Pretty jeff good. feel free Pretty to use one. it on a reissue um <laughs> so the thing I, I really didn't like was when ken said we weren't allowed to discuss the bonus tracks because i think those are all really yeah. Yeah. The, 
I think they're all really good and do add to the story as such and uh, yeah. again continue on the theme so uh, if you are able to find those I think they're up on YouTube you can check them out and listen to them as well the bouncer is absolutely fantastic uh, as, well they all are they're, they're really good really good pop songs as such mm-hmm. um, Lonnie what was your interpretation of the time story? Did it make sense? Was it something um, I think like Mark was just talking about that you could drop the needle on or that you felt you had to listen to all the way through? No, I feel like you could, you could, I think it, it's, it serves well both ways. And I think good kind, a good concept album works both ways in that you can drop the needle on any one of them and a good song is a good song, you know, or listen to the whole thing through. And it all makes sense. So to me, I think, I think it does work that way. And that, you know, you, you can, you can turn on, you know, to get to the moon, you know, and, and it works, or you can listen to it in, in sequence and it works even better. So I think in, in that way, you know, it is, it is good. Um, my ticket to the moon reminds me of Bowie, obviously, but, mm-hmm. um, but I think I think it works. I think it I, I think it works, and I think you guys would agree too. A good concept album works both ways, and I and I think it does accomplish that. Ken, going back to nineteen eighty one, I mean, were you immediately dragged mm-hmm. into a storyline here? Yeah, I think so. I I, oh, I realized it as I was going along, because um, you know I, I remember buying it. I remember it was you know the vinyl album, putting it down, and I would sit there and have the lyrics. Which they, which came with it, and followed the story, um, and it did make sense. I thought, oh, okay, this is you know the future. You know what happened to this guy? Uh, get uh, to me, it's like he got abducted, uh, mm-hmm. but but it was a dream that he got abducted, um, and then was was taken and and taken over a hundred years into the future, and. Uh, but yeah, I, I followed it right along, and I could see, you know, yeah, he's, he wants to send a letter back to his his you know girl from you know uh, the earlier time, nineteen eighties, and it was so interesting in li- listening to it at that when you hear a uh, uh, lyric like you know uh, I'd like to be you know go back to the good old 1980s and I'm, I'm thinking man we're right here but yeah it did sound like the future it the, the album sound like the future so yeah okay this is the future and it was it's he's glad to or he would be glad to be back where we are right now and i'm thinking hmm, is it that good right now <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah it's just a a a great great to me it's the story worked I mean, there, yeah, there's some things in there you're like, okay, but for the most part, yeah, I can follow the story and it makes sense. Mark. Yes. So um, I kind of uh, enjoyed the storyline. Um, being somebody who myself has worked on concept <laughs> record myself, right. I, I kind of thought that it was an interesting thing to have listened to now, right? It was something that I'm still in that mindset still. So, um I thought it was well done, actually, because, I mean, it, it's not easy to put words down on paper and have people read it and then it'd be clear enough to some people to grasp what you're trying to say in a story. That's the hard part, because sometimes you may have in your mind such an elaborate story that in order for you to give it, to make it clear, it might take you like 30 pages to write it out for people to do, like to get a grasp of it. But you can't do that on a record, you know, you have to kind of condense it and make it to mm-hmm. the point in it. And I think that he did a good job to it, with it. I think that the story, like Ken said, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that he was abducted into the future and then realized how much of the 80s he missed once he was away from it, right? And then, you know, the story, the, a lot of the songs reflected on that, you know? Like, the, you know, it, it, it's, 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 that's the way you have to make the story. You have to make those parts of it uh, like like individual chapters of a book, right? Each song, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that it was very, very written, like written very strongly. I think that uh, I had no trouble following it, and I think that's the most important thing with a concept record. I mean, one of the concept records I had trouble with the first time I heard it was uh, "Scenes from a Memory" 
Dream Theater because I remember the ending of that album was so confusing. Like, what the hell happened at the end there uh, of that story? I just had no clue what was going on. I, and I had to literally look up the, you know, the, the ex- explanation on Wikipedia for that. But like, I like these kind of stories where he didn't have to, you know, dive so deeply into it to figure out what the hell was going on. So I think it was well written. Yeah, uh, for me, I didn't get. Did it make sense? No, not at all. So it's gonna be the downer. <laughs> no, no, wow. I, I, no, I, I, I just found it to be more of a thematic album rather than a concept mm. album. Uh, that I found that I would be able to drop a needle on this album because all the songs, yeah, they all relate to time in some way. Whether it's how I'm envisaging him going back in time musically, or the the character is, you know, has the IBM girlfriend and yours truly, twenty ninety five, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but there's no obvious lineal story for me, and um, maybe that's just the way I process it. It's a collection of, you know. Of, of, of songs that relate to a subject and different aspects of that subject without actually having a plot that you can follow, um, you know, f- from beginning through end of time. So, you know, a- again, that's just, just what I make of it. And I'm probably wrong, but, you know, what's new? <laughs> um, were there any songs that you didn't think fit the concept or just were... Not not necessary, Ken. Not necessary. Well, I think they were pretty much all necessary. Like I said, you know, Hold On To Your Dream was kind of, I think, an afterthought and that Jeff probably thought he needed to throw a hit single on, <laughs> you know, come up with something and put it, throw it on that, there at the end, which he's done before on other albums. Like, you know, Don't Bring Me Down, they were pretty much done, and he decided... Oh, you know what, guys? You go out there, I'm going to go to the studio, and you like whipped out the song in five minutes. I mean, stuff like that. You're like, yeah, I need, we needed an upbeat song, so I, I quick, you know, threw something together. So I think it was something like that, but he was able to write such a great song and so easily like that. Uh, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, Hold On To Your Dream, I can see it because now more so because if you following the story it is i think a dream and you, know, you gotta hold on to your dreams or whatever that may be um so yeah i mean it all to me it all it all works for me it, it really does lonnie i don't know i think rain is falling isn't necessary <laughs> <laughs> sorry julian <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's just me. Um, I, yep, I, mean, it is you. I mean, to be to be selfish, the two songs I didn't like, the two songs I really didn't care for, I don't think they were necessary. How about that? <laughs> you know, rain go, rain is falling, and and the lights go down. I don't think they were necessary. That was they brought me down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to an adult, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, actually, I think that all of it fit. I mean, I'm kind of thinking about it from uh, the writer's perspective in the sense that, you know, you're you're sitting there trying to f- come up with this story to go through and to project to your listeners. And I think that at the end of it, he figured that this were these were the so- these were the songs that would tell the story the strongest. So I think that all of them were necessary. I think almost in his mind, if he was to take one of them out, it might screw up the story or make the story weaker in some way. It wouldn't be able to tell the story as strongly. So I think all of it was needed. Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair. I, th- I felt that if one song could be booted off the, the album, it'd be When the Lights Go Down. I mean, I actually bought this because I wanted liner notes to try and explain what the hell, you know, it was about so that that was why I, I bought it you know i would have flipped that song and i would have made sure that you know when time stood still was included again um it just seemed to be like part of the missing you know it seemed to have a story to tell but you know it as it is i could listen to this album and i've listened to it a lot over the last few weeks um you know, and I've not skipped around it. I've I've just played it over over on repeat when I'm on Spotify, and you know, I I can't change it. It it, it now is what it is, even if Lonnie doesn't like 
Same thing as me. <laughs> uh, Ken, did I ask you that question? Because I've lost track of where I was. What? The one that... Uh... Well, there's yeah, any yeah. songs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. well... You did. All right, uh, so before we go to final thoughts on, on the album, wrap up, Mark, mm. question just for you. As a working musician, someone who's creating, were there any sounds or things in this album when you were listening to it that kind of jump out at you and you're like, oh, I'd like to mess around with that or uh, anything inspire you? Uh, I mean, obviously, you've got your own concept albums and a, a diverse amount of musicality that you speak through. But was there anything that kind of piqued your interest? Well, let's put it this way. A lot of the synth sounds that he used are always fascinating to me because these are now regarded as vintage keyboards now. Like even the Fairlight and these ones are regarded as, you know, very vintage and very expensive to find. I mean, even the most basic of keyboards, like the Mellotrons and stuff like that, to find an original one that works and, you know, that, that that's like a big find you know that's like you know that's like a, a, the equivalent of like you know finding a double platinum australian pressing or something you know that's it's, it's, it's that rare you know and um those are the kind of things like when i hear these kind of vintagey sounds that always make me kind of smile and go damn i wish i could find these keyboards and use them because we have recreations of them sure we have digital versions of it now and modern keyboards and we have plugins and all these things that we can use and while some of them are close you know some of the mini moog ones are pretty decent and some of the hammond organ ones are okay but a hammond organ plugin will never sound as good as the hammond organ that i have sound and this actual physical yamaha ex7 keyboard and that even isn't as good as an actual hammond organ from the 1950s or the 60s you know so i'm always kind of envious of people like Mr. Jefflin, who has access to these kind of gear like that, you know, that can take those uh, sounds and manipulate them and do whatever he wants with them. And again, you know, I'll, I'll admit, and this is a little, you know, admittal here that every once in a blue moon, I always kind of think to myself, what would a Project Gemini sound like if I did use a gated drum sound like Phil Collins did back in those 80s? <laughs> you know, but then it quickly goes like, no, it'll totally date my stuff if I did that. And I must steer away from that. But <clears throat> it, but, but just, I think that comes from the fact that being on that end of the board, you always want to try to fiddle with the gear and how did they do it? You know, what do I do? Like, how do I achieve that sound? That's more of the the allure of it than maybe the actual sound itself. Nice. Always good to go inside the mind of an artist. <laughs> uh, Lonnie, final thoughts on ELO's time? You know, it's good. I think it's a good timestamp of 1981. Like I said earlier, I think it's interesting. I think it's, I like, as I said at the top of the show, I like listening to albums and thinking about when they came out and, you know, what else was going on in music at that time when these albums came out to see how it compares to what was popular and what artists that I love were doing at the time. So um, it's very 80s sounding. Um, it's a left turn from ELO, which is what Kiss did in 1981 as well. So I think that's interesting in and of itself. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I it's, it's interesting and it's fun for me to expand my horizons. So, and I think that's what this show is about for not only the group of us, but for the listening audience. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a fun exercise. Yeah. The exercise was not a waste of time. Boom. Oh, no. um, wow. Julian, you are so good. I'm going to, you, that's, that's why you run point. <laughs> I, I'm going to enjoy listening to this album in the future to try and nail down some of those influences that I hear coming through. Again, there were songs that reminded me of other songs like Best Friend's Girl, uh, where the cars jumped out at me, like a bit of that in, in one song. Obviously, the vocal stuff that I mentioned. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having a relationship with this album of, you know, just for my own satisfaction of what did that make me think of that made it seem so familiar, so warm, so, so friendly. Um, but it really is. I, I think it's been described as Jeff Lynn's Sgt. Pepper's. And whether mm. that's hyperbole or exaggeration, I, yeah. I, I don't really know. But it really is grand as an album and as a piece of art. It's so many la layers and textures that it's really fun. Mark, uh, your final thoughts on time? 
Um, yeah, I, I really, I really actually enjoyed it. I mean, it. This is one of the things that I'm liking about this podcast and looking forward to future episodes. Is that taking records that we don't necessarily listen to frequently or maybe even at all, take a deep dive into it and figure out why these records may be connected with the people that they did. Like, why was it so strong a connection for Ken? You know, why did it connect so much for him? And I mean, it starts to show because, you know, he, he, he mentioned the influences that are apparent to Jeff Lynn on there are probably things that he likes as well. ABBA, Beatles and stuff like that. They're all mm-hmm. there. Ours, so yeah. there's, yeah, so there's that connection with it. So I, I think it's a it's a good record. Um, like I said, if I have more time with it, which I'm going to give myself more time with it, I have it on my iPod, um, it will, I think, more than likely grow in its stature in my ranking. Yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to torturing you guys with some of my eclectic guilty pleasure <laughs> picks to have you analyze. And we won't, I won't force Zodiac Mind Warp on you because I, that'll be a whole episode to itself. Uh, Ken, <laughs> um, give us the final word on time. Well, I think if you like melodic music, if if you do like Beatles and <laughs> we said Abba and other stuff, or if you just like ELO and you haven't gotten that far, you know, gotten out of the 70s stuff, um, yeah, take take a chance on it. It's really good. Um, some things, you know, you mentioned this, so Sergeant Pepper. Um, I think the one reviewer I saw out there said that, yeah, it was, it's Sergeant Pepper meets Star Trek. <laughs> kind of thing, um, which I said, oh, yeah, 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 I guess you could say that. Um, but yeah, back at the time, eighties, it was ahead of its time. It was, you know, I listened to it. Yeah. I hadn't heard anything like it before. It, there was nothing like that out there, you know, that period. So it was ahead of its time. Now it sounds dated because then the, a lot that followed it was that kind of sound. I think they were a big influence. Uh, on a lot of artists uh, that followed during the 80s. Um, some of the other, just I guess throw out some stats there, um, you know, Canada, it went to number seven in Canada, um, went to 16 in, in in the U.S. on the Billboard charts, and then also it went to U.K. It was a number, number one, their first number one album in the U.K. at the mm-hmm. time, yeah. And it went, you know, gold here and platinum in the U.K., so... Those are some things, uh, obviously, you know, they were probably, well, last couple, there was only a couple more album, ELO albums at that time in the 80s that were going to happen um, until, you know, around 2001. But uh, the band was a long break. Um, but <clears throat> it's a great album. I mean, I like the other stuff, too. The other stuff sounds different. It's just ELO, and it's just good music. I mean, Jeff Lynn just is a, a master at writing songs and writing songs that have a, a good melody and a and great producer. Nice. Well, there you are. Yellow's Time. That's our thoughts on it and our experiences with this album. I hope you'll, uh, you know, if you're quarantined, take the time to sign up for Spotify or maybe iTunes so the artist actually gets paid. And, uh, you know, do check it out and let us know your thoughts about this album. Were you listening to it in 1981? Were you a longtime fan of ELO when this came out? What did you think of it? What did you think of some of the points we raised about this album? Um, But I guess for now, from Ken, from Mark, from Lonnie, myself, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you again on the Look It's Rock and Roll podcast. Bye for now. Thank you for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe to us, like us, or even leave us a review. You can find us and join the conversation on Facebook.